Um, in his opening remarks, Joe Silk uh, touched upon an issue of specifying the universe in terms of a small number of parameters. And he decided to include some constants of physics as well as some cosmological parameters. I'm going to, in this talk, work towards talking about how many parameters one might need to characterize cosmological solutions of Einstein's equations and compare that with the number that we tend to use in practice and with various other twists associated with this. So if you're a relativistic cosmologist, uh, even if you're not an American one who traveled in yesterday, you can now go quietly to sleep. You will uh, not learn very much, I think, that you don't know already. You might see some things put together in a way you hadn't seen before. Uh, I'm talking primarily, I hope, to philosophers of cosmology or people who tend just to see a particular class of cosmological models uh, that George alluded to this morning, isotropic and homogeneous models, and try to show you how one might assess how general they are or not uh, in the context of all the solutions of the Einstein's equations and some of the situations where one might be interested in their generality. Well, to start off, let's uh, take a step backwards towards theories of gravity and theories of uh, cosmology that spring from them. The remarkable thing about the general theory of relativity, that was a first and it was unique. Every solution of Einstein's equations describes an entire universe. Some of the solutions we don't use in that way. We might just use them as an approximation to describe the space-time of our solar system ignoring everything else. But every solution describes an entire universe. Newtonian gravity has some overlap in terms of its solutions with general relativity. So there is uh, a large uh, set, as it were, of solutions of Einstein's equations, <coughs> a smaller set of solutions of uh, Newton's theory of gravity, and there is some overlap. But there are solutions of general relativity which have no Newtonian counterpart, and there are solutions of Newtonian gravity that have no general relativistic counterpart. The simple cosmologists that we know and love, like the Friedman models, uh, mathematically live in this overlap region that was identified by Milne and McRae uh, a long time ago. Uh, why there are funny solutions here which do, don't have general relativity counterparts uh, is really partially a consequence of the fact that you might hope one day that you might make some progress in characterizing general relativity by having two inequalities. Special relativity you recognize as being founded around the idea that there's a maximum speed of information transfer given by the speed of light. But uh, there's interesting evidence, uh, you'll see a recent paper by Gary Gibbons and me again about this, that in general relativity there's a maximum force, c to the force over g, uh, if you form Planck units of physical quantities out of G, C, and Planck's constant, there are some interesting quantities in which Planck's constant does not appear in the natural unit. And therefore, that unit is classical. So power and force have that property. Uh, and so this appearance of the Planck fundamental unit of force indicates there's something special about that unit. Well, if you look in Newtonian gravity, there are no such restrictions. And so you can have unlimited speeds, and more particularly, you can have unlimited forces because 1 over r squared can become as large as you like with point particles. And uh, the classic example of Zia from the 1970s, a universe in which there are five bodies, there are two uh, binary systems counter-rotating, so there's zero net angular momentum. Uh, they're all equal mass, and then you have a light particle oscillating between the two. So you create a three-body problem with a recoil here. Little mass goes back to this system, hits another recoil there, and this goes on ad infinitum. But remarkably, the system expands to infinite size in finite time. So a completely unexpected result. And it undergoes a finite number of oscillations. General relativity, this is impossible if you try to get to particles point-like or otherwise, too close, a horizon forms around them, and this sort of thing can't happen. General relativity, of course, has an uh, analogous awkwardness problem. Uh, the Einstein equations represented schematically, uh, as relativists know, any metric uh, 
that you care to choose satisfies those equations for some stress energy tensor. So if you're an editor of a general relativity journal, uh, you know this very well indeed. Lots of exact solutions will be submitted to you uh, that are constructed by that formula. So the story about development of general relativistic cosmology, there is a way of writing it in which it is entirely the story of different attitudes and ideas and models as to what the energy momentum tensor of the universe should be. So if you look in the 1960s, for example, you'll find singularity theorems of great mathematical beauty. Uh, so George here played a key role in that game, and many of them will uh, try to persuade you at the time that density plus three times the pressure being positive is absolutely required and natural and highly physical. Uh, and this is one of the axioms of the theorem. But if you're an inf inflationary cosmologist in the 1980s, then the violation of that inequality is now sold as being absolutely natural and required and physical. Uh, so it's the complete opposite uh, is the condition on the energy momentum tensor. Okay, well, the simplest cosmological models uh, that are referred to uh, in our, by our first two speakers are those which are homogeneous and isotropic, they were the first to be found. Uh, they have Newtonian counterparts, even when lambda is present. And uh, the Friedman equation looks like that. It involves a, uh, a constant of integration. The Newtonian level, it's the total energy. Uh, general relativistic level, it has a geometrical interpretation. And these are pictures for the dust case. And this is the special value of the cosmological constant that gives you the Einstein universe for that equation of state. And here is a schematic of what happens when you change K and you change lambda. So you can have closed universes and open universes and loitering universes and uh, emergent universes, uh, universes with a minima, universes with a maximum, and so on. So these are standard repertoire of cosmological models that are used uh, to try to interpret data in the simplest possible way. But one might, if you're interested in the philosophy of cosmology, in particular as well as uh, cosmology with a small c, you might like to know what's the status of these solutions, as it were, within the entire empire of solutions of Einstein's equations. Uh, how special are they? What are their stability properties? And the issue of stability and of generality you see popping up in cosmology in the past and the present in all sorts of different contexts. And this is a little resume of what uh, some of them have been. <clears throat> so originally, back in the 1930s, this question arises over Einstein's static universe. So is it stable or not? And Eddington and Lemaitre showed uh, that it wasn't in the dust case. Later on, uh, uh, Gary Gibbons and George and myself and others uh, showed there's sort of nuance to this. Okay, that if the uh, sound speed gets bigger than the 1 over the square root of 5, uh, it's no longer uh, unstable. In some sense, the gene's length becomes bigger than the size of the universe. The whole issue of whether there are singularities or not, which continues to this day, both uh, naked singularities or Big Bang singularities in the past, uh, are these generic features of general relativity or of other gravity theories? So there's the issue of whether that's the case even without quantum gravity, and then there's the issue of what happens when you introduce unusual fields. And more recently, the issue of finite time singularities. So Einstein's equations and Friedman's equations allow finite time singularities, singularities in the acceleration and the pressure to arise, even though the density is finite, the expansion rate is finite, and rho plus 3p is positive. The next uh, issue about generality was closed time-like lines. So after Gödel found his solution uh, with closed time-like lines, there was a long history which continues today to try to make precise some idea of the sort that if you take an open set of initial data, uh, it's not going to evolve closed time-like curves, uh, unless there's one in the initial data to start with. But during the period of the 60s up to about 1981, uh, issues of generality and stability were uh, very much a focus of cosmology in trying to understand properties like why the universe is 
is isotropic or almost homogeneous. So the good description by an isotropic and homogeneous universe today was the issue. Could you explain that without resort to special initial conditions by having very anisotropic initial conditions and physical processes alone, viscosities, damping, and so forth, which would render those chaotic initial conditions, as they were called, uh, into a pretty isotropic state consistent with observation today. This story changed with the advent of inflation. So inflation solved this problem, but in a different way, without any dissipation of the anisotropy, but simply by dramatically accelerating a small local smooth patch, uh, and in that process, reducing anisotropies uh, in accord with the no-hair theorem, which we'll refer to uh, a bit later. At the other end of the time spectrum, there was interest in what's the general solution of the Einstein equations as t goes to zero. So work of Belinsky and Kalatnikov and by Misner independently had identified a rather complex chaotic dynamics, which seemed to characterize uh, the ultimate stages both of local gravitational collapse and the beginning of the universe. Nowadays, these issues of generality, there's the issue of no hair theorems, but people become interested in this early time problem again as you try to explore what would be the consequences of having a cyclic universe that bounces at some finite radius. Will anisotropies and inhomogeneities always grow dramatically as you approach a bounce, or can you engineer the equation of state uh, to damp that out? And people explore that in rather restrictive case where the pressure is assumed to be isotropic. And uh, lastly, there's a problem, again, that George was greatly interested in and contributed to uh, that I think philosophers of science called the underdetermination problem. If you take an almost minimally empiricist view uh, and you just look out of the window with your telescopes and gather data, what can you learn from that data first without a theory? Uh, and then if you allow a theory like general relativity uh, to be assumed. So this is proceeding in a different way to the way most science is done, most astronomy is done. Uh, it doesn't work like that. It assumes some parameterized model, which seems reasonable, and then places bounds on the parameters by using the observations. Well, let's do some simple counting. Uh, and we'll return later to the advertised simple scenario which Joe mentioned. So suppose that you were just uh, looking at the rather simple initial value problem of general relativity on a space-like slice. And you pick your uh, synchronous coordinate system. How many pieces of initial data do you need to characterize the general solution uh, in vacuum? Well, you need six uh, three by three symmetric uh, metric tensor terms and six time derivatives of that three by three spatial metric. Uh, but you've got four constraint equations, first integrals, the R naught A equations, and you've got four coordinate covariances which you can use to kill off some of these functions. So that's leaving you with four spatial functions of three variables to prescribe uh, a piece of the general solution on a T is constant slice. That's a sort of naive counting scenario. If you wanted to add a perfect fluid, what would you have to do? Well, if you, you would have to add a prescription for the pressure or the density if you also have an equation of state. So let's assume there is one. And you would need to prescribe three uh, non-co-moving velocity components. The fourth one's taken care of by the normalization. So uh, you would have an extra four functions to prescribe in the general case. If you wanted to add a scalar field, then you need to, you need a phi and a phi dot. So, uh, so this is a sort of simplest possible uh, count that you might do. And if you restrict your attention to cosmologies which are spatially homogeneous, the so-called Bianchi classification, then these functions of space just become constants. I think the most general cosmological solution to Einstein's equations that's known uh, with matter in it probably has, I think, about five functions. Uh, although they don't do anything terribly interesting. I think that's Sekeresh's metric. Solutions that you know and love, suppose you have a flat Friedman 
model with zero curvature, the so-called Einstein de Sitter model, this has got no uh, free parameters, basically. Uh, and the Milne model, K is minus one, has none. If you move to an anisotropic model like Kasner's famous vacuum solution, this has one constant specifying it. And if you took one of these very general chaotic dynamical models that are spatially homogeneous, so-called mixed master model, this would have four constant parameters to define it. So let's just look a bit at what some of these uh, parameters might be. Uh, remember, we just got one matter field. So this is Kasner's solution, if you've not encountered it before. It's not very general, but it turns out to be a basic building block of all the most general solutions. And one can see that from dynamical analysis, uh, approximate analysis. Kasner was at Barnard College, uh, Columbia, which I think is where Jana Levin uh, teaches now. Uh, but I think he had died long before she joined. Uh, you, you know of Kasner even if you think you don't. You remember Mathematics for the Million, uh, Kasner and, uh, and co. And he gave you the word Google and the word Googleplex as well. So he and his little nephew invented those words. A slightly different spelling. So the funny thing about the Kasner universe, it's a vacuum universe. It's rather like an expanding ellipsoid. Uh, it's got three different scale factors. One implodes and two expand, but the volume expands. And in different directions, the expansion rates are P, Q, and R, and their sum equals 1. That's the volume. And the sum of their squares is 1. And therefore, there are two constraints and three parameters, and these parameters have these uh, ranges. So what are all these other parameters doing? Cosmological models can do uh, several things. Okay, besides simply expand in volume, uh, they can distort in that their shape can change at constant volume from, say, a sphere to an ellipse, uh, or it could rotate. And associated with these different types of dynamics, there are new non-Newtonian ingredients. And the most important is that the three curvature, that K in the Friedman equation, can now be anisotropic. So this is... Uh, an ingredient that has non-Newtonian uh, aspects. But fortunately, in the case where you forget about inhomogeneity, and therefore the Einstein equations are ODEs, uh, you have a simple group theoretic classification of the possibilities. And there's a small finite number of 10. What you mean operationally by being spatially homogeneous is that everyone sees the same history. And you can see that there would be a group theoretic way to make this precise, that one person's history, you could uh, map it into another one, uh, and so forth. And Bianchi did this for homogeneous spaces in the 19th century, and Taub realized that it could be applied to cosmology uh, in uh, 1951. And here's Taub at Berkeley as a postdoc, and here is a uh, a picture of Bianchi, which I got from his current family, uh, which I think has not been seen uh, before. If you look for his picture on the web, you'll find some rather boring uh, portrait from his complete works. And he's taking his dog for a walk here uh, in the 19th century. Well, his classification, so you can see some of these parameters, so uh, they have this Roman numeric uh, form of increasing generality. So here you see in vacuum how there's Kasner, it's type 1. You go to two constants, 3, 4. Here's the simplest generalization of the open Friedman model. Uh, here's the simplest generalization of the closed one, which is type 9. So within these counts here, you've got special cases where there might just be one parameter, then two, then three, then four. If you add a fluid, uh, you don't necessarily just get four extra parameters, so some constraints stop you adding uh, the full generality. So if you add here perfect fluid, it's not allowed to have uh, non-co-moving velocities. So, so this is a rather simple uh, prescription, uh, and this is the case where the spatial topology is natural or simple. So uh, it's R3 in every case except type 9 where it's S3. And we'll show on one picture, in fact, if you make the topology uh, compact, uh, 
this completely changes. So let's go back to our original advertisement. So there are various popular books, I think, on the market. I think Martin Rees has one that's called something like The Search for Six Numbers, and uh, Michael Rand Robinson has the one that's called something like The Search for Nine Numbers. Uh, and Joe was searching for 12 numbers, I think, this morning, but he was adding some extra things into the story. Uh, so when you read The Search for Six Numbers, uh, then what's going on, this is a sort of minimal model that... Uh, observational cosmologists and many theorists would use to try to accommodate large data sets like WMAP or, or, or Planck. And their first hope is that they might encompass all the information on offer in a model with just this number of parameters. Now, they may fail, but uh, that's the aim. Uh, and this six-parameter model, which has become known as minimal lambda C DM, uh, the parameters that will be fitted... Uh, uh, sound a little different to our function counting, but at root they're related, uh, is the Hubble constant. And then you have some densities. And you will have more than one matter source in this uh, simple model. So there might be baryons, there might be some non-baryonic so-called cold dark matter. And then there's something related to the radiation, the optical depth, uh, Joe put on his slide. And then the inhomogeneity is just taken into account by the assumption of some power spectrum with an amplitude uh, to be ascertained and some spectral index. So there's an assumption that the spectrum is as simple as possible, really. There are other sorts of matter in the model, of course. There are neutrinos, at least three species, but it's assumed that we can compute their densities in the usual way from the radiation density. But if you were a purist, you would add these in as separate fields. So effectively, there are five matter fields. I use F as the, uh, the label uh, in this scenario. There's radiation, uh, there's uh, um, baryons, there's non-baryonic material. There's going to be dark energy uh, as well. This standard model will assume that K is zero. If you allow K to be non-zero, you've got one more parameter. So what's happening? Let's look at the same uh, counting story that we did before, so that's what we looked at. Uh, if we're adding some number of matter fields and some number of scalar fields in the universe as well, then your pres complete prescription of the general solution would need 4 times 1 plus f plus 2f spatial functions at constant time. So if you think that you've got at least five uh, matter fields to worry about, you're searching, in general, for 24 or more functions for a complete description uh, of the universe. If you believe in higher-order gravity theories, so uh, theories in which the Lagrangian is not linear in the uh, four curvature, but maybe has quadratic terms, uh, so-called F of R gravity, then this count changes in a fairly simple way. The field equations are fourth order in those theories, so you've got another six second and six third derivatives of the metric in the initial data set to worry about. So you've got another uh, 12 things to add. So you're looking at 16 plus 4f uh, plus 2f s rather than this combination. What was s? S is the number of different scalar fields, and f is the number of matter fields. I'm sort of... Uh, I'm, I, I'm skipping over quickly whether you think the cosmological constant is a scalar field or where you, where you count it. And we'll see in a moment, I guess, the next question you ask, well, where have all these functions gone to? Okay, so why are we just worrying about a five or six? Uh, I'll show a little chart later on, but if you were to introduce compact topologies to, let's just say, the spatially homogeneous models, there would be a big change. So uh, you would be compactifying the flat universes and the negatively curved universes. And this is such a, a demanding thing to do that, in fact, the most general open universes of Bianchi type 7H and 5 are required to be isotropic. And the most general model uh, with compact topology becomes the type 1 model. It requires many more parameters to specify its topology uh, and the other very general one is type 8 that has an unlimited number of parameters 
that you might need. So in type 1, your uh, 1 plus f parameter turns into 10 plus f with compactification of the space. So here's a little chart that just shows that. Uh, if you have the old story, no compact space, this is how many parameters you need for the homogeneous models with F matter fields. But if you compactify the topology, what happens is peculiar, so a couple of the models no longer exist. Uh, the very simplest one becomes suddenly the most general by this criteria. Uh, and uh, the previously most general open one uh, now becomes almost the least general one. So the topology, the story is here, is a big factor. If you are inhomogeneous, uh, there's a new story. And I don't know the generic situation uh, when you allow inhomogeneity. Well, the next question you might ask about this is where, you know, where have, uh, where have all the functions gone? Why are you talking about a six uh, parameter description of the universe when in general you require this huge number? And inflation plays uh, a key role, it's believed here. So one of the advertisements about inflation right from the beginning is that it can drive the expansion very close locally to an isotropic and homogeneous scenario. So in effect, there is a new attractor in the model from what there would have been if there was no inflationary field, no cosmological constant. So if you look at the late expansion behavior of a general ever-expanding universe with no cosmological constant, it doesn't isotropize. It approaches a solution where the shear to the Hubble rate is a constant. So isotropic expansion is stable, but it is not asymptotically stable. So models don't approach isotropy, but the isotropy is bounded. And isotropy rather is bounded. So here's a, uh, a simple and nice statement of uh, no hair theorem. So many of these theorems appeared almost at the same time, slightly different uh, prescriptions and ways of expression. Uh, there was one by Bob Wald, it's very well known, spatially homogeneous models. One by me and by Gary Gibbons for inhomogeneous models. And then here one by uh, uh, Starobinsky, uh, which is a sort of series expansion model. And I'll pick this one because it fits in with what we've just been saying. So what's argued, we take our metric here again, and what you're wishing to do in practice is to assume that asymptotically the metric approaches this sort of form. So h is constant, it's the square root of lambda over 3, and so you're really saying that the leading order term of the metric in an inflationary phase which goes on for a long time, it approaches the sitter with some spatial distortion. Uh, and then there are these two series terms, one constant and one uh, falling. And A, B, and C are matrices which are functions of space. And what have you got to do to show that this would be the general behavior? You've got to put this in the Einstein equations, use the constraints, and see how many functions remain free. So is it the full number, four? If so, you can argue that this is a generic behavior for a local region. And in fact, that is the case. So uh, two of the, uh, the A matrix terms are left free and two in C are left free. Uh, if you picked on radiation, for example, as the matter source, then uh, the trace of C becomes zero. The density falls like one over the volume to the four thirds, exactly as you would expect. But uh, there's an interesting other effect here uh, that we knew about in other situations, but uh, it's often gone unnoticed. In the radiation case, uh, the velocity doesn't go away. Okay? It just stays constant. So the asymptotic state, the radiation universe with lambda, is not exactly de Sitter, but it's uh, de Sitter with a tilted velocity field. So Roger Penrose's sort of conformal cyclic model, I think, might well be killed by this fact. He wishes to have lambda approaching de Sitter at late time, and everything turns into radiation so that it can then switch around and be the new beginning. But it's a new beginning with the tilted radiation field. So what's going on there is simple to explain by conservation of angular momentum. You know, if you just work out the angular momentum of a little eddy, 
the expanding universe, uh, it approaches a constant, regardless of whether the dynamics are De Sitter or Friedman. So, so there's an application. Uh, in the matter case, there are eight free functions in this story. So this is how you would evaluate whether cosmic no-hair is a generic conclusion. If you believe in, uh, you're worried about finite time singularities in general relativity, uh, the sudden singularities that I introduced some years ago, where the acceleration becomes infinite, the pressure becomes infinite, then in fact you can show that there's a very simple generic form for the metric, which was like the sort of example uh, defining form in Friedman, but that turns out to be a nine function general solution. Nine rather than eight, because there's no equation of state assumed. So in the Friedman equation, what happens is that there are singularities in P, in rho dot, in A double dot, and P, but everything is finite here. So these are not geodesic incompleteness singularities. They're quite different. Another issue here about function counting I referred to earlier is this underdetermination problem. Now, George Ellison, Bill Stoker, and... Uh, Roy Martins and uh, collaborators uh, had a series of interesting papers where they looked at this type of problem, uh, but they're not specifying generality uh, on a space-like slice, but on our past null cone. So you're interested in all the observations that you might make in an ideal world, number counts, proper motions, redshifts, image sizes, and so on. And you ask the question, is there enough information in those observations to reconstruct our past light cone without using a theory of gravity? Just assume, say, that you have a metric theory, so you have geodesic equations. Uh, and uh, if you don't assume general relativity, uh, then you can't do that. You shouldn't be very surprised from that. by that. Uh, it will be very demanding. If you add general relativity as a theory, you then have field equations and you can do other things. So this is just uh, an interesting contrast of another way of prescribing the general solution, but uh, null coordinates on our past light cone. And philosophers of cosmology, I know in a first meeting that we had in Oxford, uh, Jeremy Butterfield talked about sort of modern interest in this type of problem. Uh, and there was a paper with a rather elaborate construction of a model uh, which couldn't be determined by uh, observations. So I think it's possible to construct much, much simpler ones to make the point. Lastly, uh, when one talks about generality, this function counting approach can give you a different version of the story than if you think about dynamic complexity. So uh, the famous case was the mixed master universe, so-called by Misner in 1969, which is the Bianchi type 9 model, and most people regard this as very likely uh, the most general behavior that can occur in spatially homogeneous models. Where it occurs in inhomogeneous models is another story. And what happens in this model is that you have three scale factors against time. As you approach the singularity, the scale factors oscillate in a chaotic fashion. And perhaps of some interest to Philosophers who have a sort of Zeno uh, background, people like uh, uh, Adolf Grunbaum. Uh, you know, if you have a mathematical function like y is x times sine 1 over x, or an infinite number of oscillations of that function uh, on any interval, open interval, around x is 0. The mixed master universe is like that. There are an infinite number of spatial oscillations of the dynamics on approach to the singularity at t is 0. This is somewhat peculiar, as Misner first pointed out. Usually you uh, sort of uh, stop worrying too much about Zeno because you make arguments about the, the different Zeno steps are not physically realistic uh, demarcations of the finite interval. But in the mixed master universe, they are physically distinct, realizable configurations of the space-time. Uh, and so Misner liked to argue that in some dynamical sense, this universe was infinitely old. Here's a rather skewed sort of sketch of what's going on. You're going towards the singularity there at t is zero. There are an infinite number of these oscillations uh, in which the directions, uh, two of them implode, one of them expands, and they're permuted around. 
Dynamics are simply that of a ball moving around inside a triangular potential with corners in which the potential collapses, or sort of expands rather, as you go towards singularity. And this dynamics has a rather beautiful mathematical uh, expression, the simplest uh, aspect of the dynamics, how many oscillations in each of these little collections, is just described by the continued fraction uh, nonlinear dynamical system. So there is a discrete dynamics. Uh, you can work out all the invariant measure, uh, the metric entropy, and so on. You can do this for the full dynamics, which Dave Chernoff and I did long, long ago. So you can work out the full discrete dynamics of this model, and you can find the invariant measure. So this is a situation where you can find the measure which is intrinsically defined by the dynamics itself. And it's not separable. It's like a double continued fraction. And again, it reflects this type of chaotic dynamics. OK, 30, 45 seconds. Uh, so this function counting generality might give you a four function or four constant solution that doesn't have that chaotic behavior and another one that does. And relativistic cosmologists will probably regard the chaotic one as being more generic. The chaotic dynamics turns out to have all sorts of other unusual aspects that if you look at mixed master dynamics not with the three-dimensional SO3 invariance but say SON in n dimensions and it was found by de Marais and others long ago that when the number of dimensions becomes bigger than nine the chaotic behavior goes away so when the dimension is less than nine the vacuum it remains what's happening there you've got a triangular potential that turns into a, a sort of polygonal uh, potential and the speed of the universe point relative to the walls uh, is falling as the number of dimensions gets bigger and eventually the point doesn't catch the walls anymore. There are no more oscillations. The chaos will go away if there's any scalar field and also for some sort of unusual forms of matter you can make it go away uh, uh, in some dimensions where it's present in vacuum and if you had add higher order terms uh, it can also go away. So the peculiarity is three-dimensional general relativity spaces sort of look as the most complicated. As you increase the dimension, uh, life becomes simpler and becomes increasingly Newtonian in terms of the general solution. Well, that's a good place to stop. Uh, so I hope I've given you some flavor both of how people in relativistic cosmology ascertain whether things are general or not, how you evaluate whether you're a uh, new theory is something that's going to turn out to be stable or generic in the bigger scheme of things, and what the true function count, as it were, is for uh, astronomical data in cosmology and how it relates to the number of functions on constants that are used to ascertain uh, the best fit in Planck or WMAT data. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I've been asked once again um, to make sure that people only ask questions into the microphone and to please identify themselves um, for the recording when they're asking a question. Hi. Uh, yes, Simon Saunders. Thank you for a beautiful talk. Um, just a quick question about your uh, comment on Penrose's cyclic uh, cosmology. Um, am I correct in thinking that if total angular momentum is zero, that uh, criticism would not apply? Um, not necessarily, because you can have velocities which have no curl associated with them. So random velocities relative to the Hubble flow, which are not vortical, um, also don't die away. If the pressure's bigger than a third of the density, they actually grow. No, I don't think so. I mean, there are other things to worry about as well, like magnetic fields. But scalar fields, you see, so if, a scalar, if you try to replace a scalar field by a P equals rho perfect fluid with its velocity components, then that will be allowed to have a vorticity. And at late times, it would do large expansion. It would do horrible vortical things. But because it's a scalar field, um, uh, there are no curls associated with the velocity field. And so it doesn't have this vortical problem. Offer the have John, you have given a very nice uh, uh, summary of this ensemble of models. 
I'd be interested in your opinion on, on how, what priors do we assign to each of these models? I think this comes to the way to the prejudice we have about which model to take seriously. And we know well that a universe with non-zero lambda was taken as being you no know, ridiculous model and then turned out to be the one we like at the moment. I wonder what's your opinion about assigning priors to those models? I think I can't help you very much. I mean, a sort of public statement I'd made is that, um, that in, in cosmology, we don't know anything about the probability of anything. OK. And if you're reading a popular article or a book and the word probability uh, suddenly appears, what you're about to read is likely to be totally unfounded or just a guess or a wish. <laughs> so we, we don't know the likelihood of anything. So we, we don't know any probability measures for the initial data space of Einstein's equations. Um, uh, and, you know, as everyone here knows better than me, we don't know anything about the likelihood of different values of, of the cosmological constant. So, so this is a major problem. I mean, within issues of the story of the multiverse and so forth, you know, it might be a soluble problem, that you hope that it's a technical problem, that you might be able to come up with some probability measure that could at least make some predictions and be open to test of some sort. Um, you might even, if you were lucky, be able to test the idea of the multiverse, even though you can't see any of the other worlds. Uh, I mean, if the theory were to predict that in every world you should see a particular thing, and we didn't see it in our world, then that would falsify the theory. So it's not necessarily true that a multiverse theory is untestable. It might be. Um, but the universe is not constructed for our convenience. Uh, Jim Hartle. Um, in quantum cosmology, of course, we seek to provide a measure right, for classical histories of geometry, which are defined as um, where histories which have a high probability for correlation in time given by the Einstein equation, of which you illustrated a great uh, number, but also uh, the histories are restricted in a reasonably general way of doing that that doesn't pick out one particular wave function, like say like the no boundary wave function, is to demand that the wave function have semi-classical WKB type form in that case, uh, there's a connection uh, between, supplied by the action between the momenta and the coordinates. And I would just like to advocate that it would be an interesting program to redo your classification uh, for the subset where there's a function s, which, whose gradient provides uh, the momenta. And then, um, then you could, uh, if you want to do further cosmology, you could. Um, supply probabilities for those. But that's something that could be stated entirely classically. Yeah, I think th this is a good idea. I mean, I had suspicions always that, say, classically, these type 7 models that seem to be the generic, flat, and uh, open uh, extensions of the Friedman flat and open models, uh, there might be reasons, in fact, why they don't have quantum extensions. Um, and so, this would then render other models the most general and so forth. So I think there's, a, there's an interesting little program that could try to cross out some of, the, some of these schemes. Uh, if you want to have a compact topology, uh, you see how the story changes. But do you want to sort of sum over all topologies, as it were, as well as overall metrics? So you, you think you can do that. You can pick on what should be the natural topology. Or is that too hard? I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and this is probably the last. Uh, the problem of summing over topologies, of course, is a complex one, yeah. right, which runs into all sorts of logical programs, namely having to do with the classifiability of four manifolds, right? So it's not so easy. So those of us in the trenches in quantum cosmology are quite happy to assume the simplest topology, right? Uh, but there is information. Gibbons and I, a long time ago, calculated, for example, the wave function of the universe with various possible topologies that were available at that time, CP2 cross CP2, whatever, K3, Don's thing. Uh, 
And we just discovered in the limited class of examples that topo the complex topology is suppressed. Right, so there's some piece of data on yep. this, right? Uh, but I, I agree with you, not very much, but uh, you know, it's a program for the future. Thanks. Um, because of the draconian procedures that have been imposed on me, I think we have to um, close off the question there okay. and uh, go on to the next speaker, who's Carlo Ravelli. Uh, Carlo's told me that he's not going to give the talk that was announced in the program. Um, we'll find out what it is.